So welcome everybody. I'm very, very happy to be doing the one panel. I didn't start out with one, I usually do. But for those of you who are familiar with my work and the way I do panels, they know that I do teaching panels. And what does a teaching panel mean? It means that as I ask questions of the panelists, I don't just have like, you know, something about what is your fixation or your fixation is X, so you're doing Y. Instead, as you're answering the questions, or the panelists are answering the questions, I should say, they might display micro expressions or something that would alert me that I need to go deeper on that. We'll show it in our face, even if we've integrated it, even if it's wow. long ago that it was a problem. It still is an imprint, and there'll be a tiny little move of the mouth or a tiny little gesture of sadness or confusion or contempt, any of the emotions. So I use those in panels as well, because what they do is they bring out something that we might not have heard on the panel otherwise. And I've done it with all of them. I don't know that I mentioned that I do it, but I've known microexpressions longer than the Enneagram. So it's a kind of an important piece for me in body language and faciology. So I'm working with a lot of different typologies. The purpose is to be able to show you the type one and their deeper emotions as to why they will display certain qualities. And it really helps us develop compassion for the types if we know what's going on emotionally. And a lot of what has been done, and I've done as well, are more mental panels that are focused more on the fixation. But I like looking at the emotional aspects and especially those unknown and the core fears and looking at the convictions because those are the hard ones to change. The visceral, it's not even a thought. So the, those of you who don't know me, my name is Catherine chernet Faber. I started with the Enneagram 35 years ago, 36 actually, before there were books, but I did have a little sheet three sheets that were charts of all the passions, the fixations, and many other things, and the paragraphs on the nine types that were written by, as far as we can tell, Robert Oakes, who was the Jesuit that introduced the Enneagram to the Catholic pipeline. It went around the world, and here we are. So... I kind of already knew about the subtypes. I knew about the way Echazo taught because I started with that. Then the books came out. And unfortunately, with the books, they didn't have a chance to study with Echazo or Naranjo. And the reason being is that Naranjo was teaching in Berkeley and then he became frustrated that people were taking his work and Echazo's work and taking credit for it. And so then for 23 years, he was gone, almost 24. And then he came back and started teaching again. So it was a later situation. People had already set up their businesses. They were already teaching. They didn't know some key things. What came from home? But I may say things as we go, because I did have the good fortune to certify with Helen and David, Don and Rusty, and Kathy Hurley, and Theodore Donson, and do a 10-day intensive with Naranjo, as well as have him validate my subtype research in 1996. So that was great. So he gave me some guidance. and. I gave him what I was learning about what I called three types that went on to become tri-type and 
he was a very nice man. Then I also had a chance to do a five-day intensive with a Chazo. So I might say things slightly differently and just know that's a function of having studied with all of them and finding what was the most confluent and true. Now, how do I know what seemed the most confluent? Is because I've done research for 26 of those years and have found the types themselves what they say. I know how the types mistype and what they mistype as, because another area of study that I had done before I met the Enneagram was lexicon. So with lexicon, even if English is the second language, people will choose the words they relate to. One example I give is that we don't really have a single word, simpatico, that's Spanish, in English. It's an adjective that just really, it's a state of being, and nines love it. They always give the example, if they're Spanish speaking, that they don't, there isn't a word in English to, they have to use like three words in English to explain simpatico. So that's the case. And when my earlier test was translated into Dutch and into Russian, for example, they might have to use a sentence to explain an adjective that we have in the U.S. because we're all from someplace else. Even the indigenous people long ago were from someplace else. And we brought to this country these different languages. So that's why our adjectives are so broad. So let's begin. But some of those adjectives are really important and indicative of type, especially if they cluster. Okay, so Suzanne, will you introduce yourself? Just do a little two minute of how long you've known the Enneagram and how you use it. So my name is Suzanne. I have been studying the Enneagram since about 2002. And I use it primarily in um, working on compassion for the self, compassion for others, and applications in relationship. And I've recently become, recently, well, I'd say the last five years, very, very um, deep in study around the defense system because it seems to me that in relationship, it's two defense systems trying to get their needs met and try to protect themselves, and it really does wreak havoc. So um, the Enneagram and the types in the defense system are something I'm particularly fascinated by and very passionate about, and I work with couples and individuals as a coach and as a teacher and a facilitator, and I've spent five or so more years with Enneagram Prison Project, um, bringing the Enneagram into prison for the incarcerated, which was literally life-changing. Thank you for reminding me of that. I did that in 1995, and then again, whenever we were doing that. Oh, 15, 2015? Yeah. Yeah. It, it is life-changing, there's no question. Because then you know, if you've taught like to Team 5 at the Federal Reserve Bank, which I did, and then I taught in the prison system, you realize that the issue is the same. It doesn't matter where you are, your gender. None of those details matter because it's a defense strategy. Yeah. It's a system of strategies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Joanne. Hi, I'm Joanne Benitzo, and um, I've been studying Enneagram since what, about 94, 95? Before that. Before you that? My, you made my Enneagram map long before that. Did I? I can't remember. Like maybe 1990. Does that sound right? Does it go back that far? <laughs> I, so. I can't remember anymore. I'm sorry. It's so okay. It's been a while. It's yeah. been a while. Um, I, for me, it's really been more um, myself, understanding myself, uh, my frustration with other people and situations. And having, having that knowledge has been liberating that um, I, I'm, you know, how I can navigate better. Um, and also gaining compassion. Uh, for both myself and for others, because when you under, 
understand where somebody else is coming from, then then you can uh, you know see them with uh, a different different eyes, more compassionate eyes. For sure. Thank you, Joanne. Did you all notice that when she talked about her frustration, she just very just slightly pursed her lips, and that means that there was a lot of frustration and wounding many years before the Enneagram. And even though it wasn't a giant expression, it's still there. We're going to have it. Thank you, Joanne. Grace? Hello, I'm Grace, and um, I am definitely a novice when it comes to the Enneagram. I don't have anywhere near the amount of experience that um, some of the other panelists have. Um, but it's been absolutely fascinating since I started this journey um, earlier this year. And I would certainly echo what Joanne's been saying about understanding the frustrations that I was feeling um, with when dealing with other people and just discovering the um, defense mechanisms that Suzanne was talking about. You really, I really feel that it is a, able, you are able to navigate um, your life with with less anger and frustration <laughs> once you can understand it. So although I'm still very much early on in the journey of discovery, sounds a bit cheesy, but it's really true. Um, Which is an advantage yeah. to me because you're going to naturally say things indicative of your type that I can then highlight. And it, that's where it doesn't matter because our defense strategy is organized around those principles. So, yes, Jonathan. Hello, my name is Jonathan. I have known the Enneagram for about six years now, I think. Uh, and I don't think I use it in any particular way. I just feel like I use it all the time in general, way, just to understand people. I take uh, classes with Catherine every week uh, and I'm occasionally on certain YouTube channels, but mostly I just, as far as the Enneagram and using it goes, it's mostly just constantly reading and researching and thinking. And I got to the point where it's really hard to not look at someone and just think about their Enneagram type, whether it's a person or a, even a fictional character or whatever. I don't even plan on doing it, it just happens. Absolutely. It would be like noticing someone has blue eyes or a brown shirt, or it's just once we see something, we can't unsee it and recognize it. Or it might be a certain feature or movement that we would pay attention to. But when we know that movement or gesture, like the pursing the lips, we then think of ones. And that when that's when ones are in reaction formation, which is their defense, they're holding it back. So they want to say more, but they're being appropriate. And if it's really tough and they've risen, then the one will just be ready to be angry and then cut it off and it takes a minute for the adrenaline to go down. Actually, it takes about five minutes. It needs to be discharged quickly. And then recovery varies from person to person when we've been that triggered. Okay, Suzanne, was there any other types that you were considering before you got to type one and to sexual? Yeah, I actually started in the Enneagram as a nine. And what I could see on myself at that time was that I did not express anger. And I'd actually go into a freeze response when I got angry. And, um, and Helen actually helped me realize that I actually was censoring my anger. I was, I was angry. I was resentful. I was really good at building a case over lots of time to have a right to be angry. And, um, and that the censorship was actually my biggest relation relationship with anger. And, um, but yeah, so I spent about a year and a half as a nine, but it didn't quite fit, kind of fit. And, um, but it didn't quite it didn't quite explain everything. And when I did discover that I was the one, I literally just sobbed. I just felt yeah. so understood and I the you should have known better. 
you shouldn't have said that. You should have seen that coming. You should have covered. I mean, that's like chronic in my my interpersonal experience of myself and getting caught off guard, getting reprimanded um, and caught off guard because I didn't think of something. I didn't take care of something. I got behind the eight ball. It's just horrifying to me. And so that that uh, that was when my type one journey began. You brought up something really important too, from the standpoint of not expressing anger. Nines don't, but they kind of go to sleep to it. They just mm. can't because they'll be separate from somebody. And the one knows they're angry, and it's not the separation. It's about doing what's appropriate. The other thing is that you have a lot of inner dialogue, so in NLP terms. So that's what probably made you think you were a nine, because you'd go in and kind of say to yourself what you're going to say before you spoke it, especially oh, yeah. anger, yeah. So mm -hmm. that is important to understand that all these things matter, but what we identify with is not necessarily our type because it's the defense strategy that is the most significant. But whatever types we thought we were in the beginning or you're considering now, they're important because they're part of your self-image. Thank you, Suzanne. Joanne. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but in the earliest days when you were first introducing us, I said, oh, I have to be an eight. That's right. Because I was so aggressive. I don't know if I appeared that way, you know, but that's well, the way. One and eight come off, at, you know, because the two gut types and they're solid and both can be aggressive. Yeah. And so, and I'm, you know, I always felt like I was trying to fight for people and whatever, but you very kindly pointed out <laughs> The underlying motivations were very, very different. And I went, oh, okay, well, clearly the one motivation is definitely the one I do identify with. You know, I really like you saying that, and I do remember it. But the ones can mistype as eights at first, because if you're just looking at descriptors, rather than understanding the motivation... That's easy to do. And for those of you who don't know, initially Achazo had the moralist as type one and the kind of libidinal forward moving energy as type eight. And he flipped him and made the eight the moralist, but it's the eight's personal morals and values, their code of honor. And he put the repression or suppression of that intense energy that all the gut types have, but that, you know, real visceral energy to the one because the whole intent is to suppress inappropriate behavior. And I think it was a, a meaningful clarification, but that came after the initial dissemination of the Enneagram, so most people wouldn't know about it unless they had studied with him. See, but I'm so glad you mentioned that because it's quite common. Okay, Grace. Um, I think I've always typed as a one, um, but when I first, I think I did one of these sort of free Enneagram tests that you find on the internet. I sort of I discovered you a bit later on. Um, so I think I initially typed as a one, two, five. And I think it's probably because um, probably at that time, perhaps I was identifying more with the teacher and the um, there were aspects of the uh, five that I felt matched with me. But then when I did your cards, then I came with the one, three, six. And actually that made more sense, especially because my other half typed as a six, three, one. And we realized we actually had quite a lot in common. And we've always we'd always thought we were quite different and opposite so he's an ENFP and I'm an ISTJ so yeah. we so we're very we're opposite on that sense but then we thought well we actually but you know in our conversation we're always like oh but we have this in common we have that in common and actually that makes sense now that we we're the same tri-type but with just different um 
with them the different leads. Perfect. Thank you. Ones often identify with two because it's one of their wing types. And the energy of the Enneagram system is that it begins at the point, whatever yours is, so minus 0.8, and it moves to 0.7 and back, to 9 and back, to the line and to then to the lines of connection, which would be to 5 and back, to 2 and back. So it's it's like a pistons that are going, and it's the energy that gets us moving or us doing things or reacting to things or pursuing things. So if it's a wing type, it's probably the type you identify as your wing. And it's just important to note that we always have both wings, but one is more externalized and one is more internalized. That's just what I've found. But in the deep inquiry process, I will, if it's a long session, I will see both wings in a subtle way. But one is generally much more dominant. Okay. Jonathan, did you ever think you were a different type? So initially when I learned the Enneagram, uh, I took some online tests. I can't remember which ones they were, but they were telling me I was either a four or a five. and I read up and went back and forth, but I don't know which one I settled on or anything. But that prompted me to uh, buy some books, and the books were actually by Herb Pierce. It's a good uh, book. Yeah, so I read his stuff, and that made sense. And then I said, "Okay, I'll think." I, I think I thought it was a five, and that didn't make sense. Uh, but I'll read through the other types now just to get a hang of them. And when I read through type one, that was like me right there on the page, everything thoughts I've had since I was a child. Like the, with the five, it was thoughts I've had since I was like an older child, but it was like as young a child as I've always had these thoughts. And there they are on the page. And uh, when I read one wing nine description, that sort of made sense of why I might think I'm a five. Uh, That's right. Yeah. For sure. And, but when the one has five and two, it creates an interesting mix. So you and Joanne both have that. You have the social, though, and she leads with the self pres. So that's a point of difference or departure. But still, there's this need to help people when you should, when there's something of value that you feel you have the ability to participate in and can't ignore it. It's just like a lurking variable with the one that has two in the tri-type. But they also have five. So when the one, two, five is presented, it's hard to understand. Because with tri-type, it isn't just the three centers that you identify with and then the type within each center. It's what happens when those three types come together. What is minimized and what is made more dominant by virtue of the types? Well, in the case of the 152, there isn't anything. It's, they're all hexad types, meaning not three, six, or nine. And together they create a pattern of attention that's very distinct. Now, we all have that, but there's some we're more familiar with than others. For example, Suzanne has the one, four, seven. So if we take the seven and four, that's 11, and one is 12, and then two plus one is three. So the one, four, seven is holding the place of three in the law of three in terms of numerology, and it's all mathematic. And then the 258 is, of course, holding 6. So 9 is holding the 9. But then there are many ways mathematically you can work this out, and it's not by chance that a hexad type is less obvious as the type that they are. 
but you'll see it in the lexicon, the words they choose, the way they talk about their issues. Someone said I should mention that when you take my test, the left column on the first results page is interactive. A lot of people don't realize it links to information like your, on your tri-type, on your instincts or what have you. So I'm, I'm on the record, I've said that. Okay, so the common names, when I did my research, the initial research in 1995, were respectable person, perfectionist, improver, reformer, idealist, judge, crusader, and critic. It's important to note that there were books being published as well, and at that time, people had to have their names a little different, which is why when I found three types, it's now tri-type, I shortly thereafter, within a year and a half, I found the existence of trifix. So I thought, I don't want to confuse everybody, I'll just call it trifix. And it wasn't until I met with the Arikans and they said, you know, we really want to trademark this term. And I said, oh, great. I'll go take trifix off of all my work because it had become a problem because everything that was written was written by me. And people didn't know that. It was my name, but they assumed that it was a Chazo. I didn't say, this is by me, not a Chazo. But because I always gave him attribution, they didn't realize it. And when it got to be a pretty giant study, it was a problem. So I readily agreed. I just wanted to honor a Chazo. And what we discovered in that conversation is that tri-type and tri-fix are different because they emerge separate from each other which is why we're going to touch on the tri-types of the panelists of one as well. And the key distinction, I have it on my test page, Enneagram tri-type test, you know, HTTP colon backslash backslash Enneagram tri-type test dot com. You'll see I've written about the dissemination of the Enneagram. I've written about, as I know it, what I learned from the teachers themselves. And also the difference between trifix and tri-type. And what we decided it was is that Achazo only looked at the fixations of each type. And what I found it was the whole type, the passion, the fixation, and the convictions. And it played out completely as a full type and the blending of those types. And he doesn't have anything on the blending of the types. He just recognized that we all use three centers. So they thought I should use the word type because I said, I'll just go back to my early name, three types. And they said, no, because you recognize that we all have three types in a hierarchy. So we still have a dominant type, but that you're using the whole type and he's using just the fixation. So what if you're tri-type and he's tri-fix. I said, great. I went home that day and I sent out a message saying just that. And it's been tri-type ever since. Okay, so summary description. Ones have a strong internal critic and believe that the world judges and punishes for bad behavior. To gain self-worth, they must have high internal standards of behavior, act responsibly and fairly, and strive for continual improvement. That's such a big one. Whenever I would do a set of nine study groups, the ones there'd be so many people that I had to have a bigger venue because it's within the nature of one to constantly improve. One's dislike unfairness irresponsibility, sloppiness, and error. They are attracted to order and high standards for themselves and others. So the most important thing here is that anybody can be a perfectionist, but are you trying to improve? Are you taking classes on improving? Are you striving to improve? Or are you just 
a perfectionist at what you do. So again, you have to look at motivation. And with the one, the motivation is to get it right, to be above criticism, to not act irresponsibly, to not be inappropriate. Suzanne, can you tell me what you noticed before you knew the Enneagram about the way you would respond to things that were frustrating or you perceived as irresponsible or inappropriate? Well, I can go back to when I was very small and order was order was something that felt really good. So I was I was raised in Canada in Montreal and everyone would come in with their snow boots on and I would just I would I would line them all up at the door. I hated them just thrown in a pile. And um and it's interesting I I I've heard people say, "Well, how did your how did your your childhood must have been very strict and very orderly." And actually that doesn't apply to me whatsoever. That order was in here and I kept wanting to create the order out here and was doing that for my whole family. I was a very parentified little girl and um um, but you know, straight A students strive harder. I mean, I remember getting a getting an award in school for having the highest score on an exam. But I was devastated because I actually had missed two. <laughs> for me, it wasn't 100%. I was minus two, and I was getting this award, and I just thought it was awful, and I felt very ashamed of that. So long before I knew the Enneagram, these this this construct of having having to strive for I never hit perfection. That's the thing. I never right. hit perfection. There's always a gap. I can see what I'm headed for, and I will give everything I have to get there, even if I do something three times or five times, or I'll do it three different ways to cover all the bases so that I am above condemnation. I've been I've been like that since I was very small. Yeah, it's really an important one. At first, people didn't understand why the one can have a fear of condemnation, and I put it on my core fears chart, which is on my website too, by the way, if you want that, at katherinefauver.com. But it's very true to be moving towards, while simultaneously towards good and order and standards and away from anything that could make you feel that way. So what is it, or did it, feel like then before you understood it was just a part of your defense strategy well it, it it was a visceral almost shame horrified um one of my strongest memories i must have been around three or four but we got in a double decker bus and i and i was up high and i thought oh my god i'm like a bird and i stuck my arm out the window so i could fly along with the bus and these people turned around in front of me that i didn't know some people on the bus and they looked get your arm in, it could get cut off. And I was so horrified that I was corrected. I should have known better. That just came all the way through my body. I should have known better how I had to be told. It was just horrifying for me. And so that the beginning of the loss of spontaneity, having to to self-audit all the time, um, that was a natural solution to being called out like that and and I remember just just curling up in a in a ball of shame and just I went into a complete freeze space I was just mortified so uh, it's a very horrible because there you lockdown there you were like free excited in the fantasy of the moment and it was just and it's yeah. even worse from a stranger. Oh, it was, it was it was very shaming, and I it just it was like I just locked down. It's like the beginning of that. You know, my body goes into an absolute state of rigidity. Just mm, like everything locks down the throat, the solar plexus, everything gets really tight, and I I can't move. And I remember that being my response to that experience. Excellent. And what a lot of people don't quite understand is that. Chazo and Naranjo taught that the dichotomy within one is rigid, sensitive, and actually it's sensitive, rigid, meaning the one is very sensitive and noticing things and interacting with all the moving parts in their life, 
and then something happens and they go rigid because you can't be that sensitive all the time. But what remains with the one, even if they go to the rigidity, it's always back and forth, the creative element, that spark, is still there because the one in the Enneagram of process is the first move around the out of nine into the other type. So the one is that first urge out of the interconnectedness. And then nine is the beginning and the end and kind of holding that process. So she just perfectly explained, when you see this video later, you will be able to notice the way she went down into her emotions when she was talking about it and also talking to herself about it. But you will see they're different. You guys are just bringing up what's really important because we want to get to the emotional need and what it feels like to be these types. Joanne, thank you, Suzanne. For me, I, I remember, again, childhood memories. Um, I, my, I was either in trouble or I was perfect. And so there was this sort of condition of this binary condition where I was either the perfect little child, always um, doing what was expected, you know, outside of the house, I was, you know, oh, your kid is so nice. And then, and when I was at home, um, I was always in trouble. But I used... I use that need for a sense of order as a way to calm myself. So what did it mean when you were in trouble, like if you were a child? I was always, it didn't matter. I had what a, did it feel like? I had a mother. Well, um, what it felt like was it was horrifying because it's like you don't, you're not allowed to exist, right. you know, and as a child though, it was, I would, I would do the either rage or I would shut down. I would go from one to the other. So depending on the situation. So then that's why part of why I was always in, out in trouble was I would fight back and say, that's not fair. That's not right. Whatever that is, you know, even as a small child, having the understanding that, you know, when you're a little kid, you don't know everything. And so how could you be this horrible thing? Um, exactly. And you know what's meaningful here is one of my favorite comments that Naranjo made is he found that ones fire their parents as being in charge of them. Yes. And they are parentified because of this very reason that their standards would be higher than their parents' standards, unless they had another one, but then they'd be different standards if their parent was a one. And then you're, you could clash over that, but that some types are parentified, some types are not. And the age progress types are the one in eight. So, Generally, that sort of expectation is there. And yet, when you successfully deliver it, it's expected even more. And so that recrimination of self, that looking for improvement, then causes the one to shame themselves as well. And not not others, as much as themselves. And that's where even missing two questions would upset Suzanne because she should have known. She should have gotten it right. She should have studied in some way or known what was on that test. So thank you, Joanne. That's, that's horrifying is a strong word. Tell me how you feel it physically. So oh, it goes through the body, uh, much like Suzanne expressed. I can see it in her. 
um, and the same in myself, where you feel literally like dying. It's like dying. You know, your energy completely goes. You you get smaller. It's like your whole body shrinks. Your whole spirit shrinks. And it's like you know, I, I'm I'm so horrible. I can't I can't even live. So, and you know, when you're little, that's pretty horrifying. It's horrifying as an adult. It's yeah. an experience. I, 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 even after all these years, I, I still have. And reaction formation is something that other people don't quite understand, but they know that the one is unhappy, even though the one didn't end up saying they were angry but their body gesture and everything was moving towards anger until they cut it off. But when that energy is rising, it's usually from the first shock or straight up and it's hot and it's overwhelming until you cut it off. But when you don't cut it off, then the one is very articulate about whatever they're upset about. And that's another thing, like some people, after they've been upset, they don't remember what they've said, and other people do. It just depends on the heightened level of upset. And if you're really upset, and you're more schizoid and core energetics, then you won't remember. But the one remembers and then feels more shame. Even if they were right, then it's, I should have done it differently, right? Would you Absolutely. say differently? Uh, no, I, I completely agree. You, you know, rather than, because it's not only what is said, but the energy with which it's said. And that energy going at other people, you can see it's, you know, they feel like they're being hit. Exactly. Thank you, Joanne, that's very helpful. And the other thing is the unconscious need of the one which is to fix and put right. So if you are broken because you got in trouble for something as a child, then there's this need to repair and fix and improve. Would you say that you fired your parents earlier than seven or because you were parentified as well? Probably not before or seven because I think it was by seven where the confrontations really became acute um you know where you really start to engage you know you're, you're out of those toddler years and you really start to have your personality emerging and a sense of self um yeah complete around age seven con- which is why we yeah, and it was from that point on, it was sort of like, this isn't working. And we move out of the magical thinking, too, because four to seven, and even three to seven is when a child is in their magical thinking. But then when the ego is completed, we look to things that are rational, irrational, in addition, inconsistencies. And if we look at the type one, the world view is about creating and maintaining standards for everyone. And the one wants everyone to benefit and enjoy utopia. But for that to happen, people have to come together. They have to do what they should, conserve where they need to, join together where they need to, and create change. And each instinct from any type, the self pres is holding on to what they have. So they're defending and protecting what they have. It could be their possessions, it could be their values, it could be their thoughts, their ideas, and able to defend really successfully. Then the social, is trying to manage the, in this case, I'll talk a little bit about one too. The, let me go back. The self pres one checks and rechecks and is thorough and there's some kind of a type of fretting 
if things aren't thoroughly checked and done properly or you haven't been given enough direction. And getting it right gives brilliance to your being. Now, all three subtypes of one ha have that feeling like when they get it right, the good feeling rises up. And the social then is trying to hold on to things, but it's split because they're also looking at others and what others need to do for this concept of a utopia where everyone does their fair share and what have you. And so there have to be rules and regulations to fulfill that potential and then it just becomes more and more organized and then fortunately and unfortunately there'll be people that rebel because they don't want to do the hard work that the one is willing to do to maintain things and that's where a lot of the frustration comes it's like well if you just picked that up instead of throwing it on the ground is a very common theme for the one and it's frustrating when people don't do what they could or if they have irrational ideas ones want things logical and rational and in a way that they can understand and it's frustrating when people are just being irrational or irresponsible thank you grace how do you relate to any of the internal critic or following the same theme of feeling that you are bad, fundamentally bad, if you do something that is perceived as inappropriate? Yeah, Unless you choose it, by the way. The ones can choose things, but when other people say it about you. Yeah, I'm... I haven't, it was interesting listening to um, Suzanne and Joanne's experiences because um, I have to say, I don't have so much of the shame and I we've discussed it before because it just depends on the situation. So I was, I didn't mind if I was criticised, if I thought there were good reasons to be criticised. And I think that must come from the wanting to improve um, uh, asset of it. Um, but it was I think my childhood memories, I feel like they're mostly dominated by my parents behaving illogically or irrationally. Yeah. And so that's when, when Joanne's talking about that, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that is like my childhood. <laughs> it was sort of having, you know, around age seven or eight, having these blazing rows with my parents. And I'd always thought it was just because I had mad Chinese parents. Um, <laughs> And because all of my nice white friends, they had normal parents. And why were you know, why did I have these mad Chinese illogical parents? And obviously now looking back, you know, I it's obviously that was just part of my one personality. Um and I just hated the fact that they would make decisions that were completely illogical and there was no good reason for them saying, no, you can't do this or no, you can't do that. And these are rules um, because actually I didn't I didn't mind rules in and of themselves as long as there seemed to be some um, rational basis for them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the I, I definitely remember at school getting 75% in an exam and being very upset because I always got 100% in science exams and so 75% was definitely a very bad and it was and it, what, and it did feel shameful I think at the time because I was so used to getting 100% for everything um, so on that occasion when I got 75% I just thought this is, this is terrible I mean you know yeah, how, I mean how I've allowed myself to have such low standards um and then obviously as I as I progressed in my career then I had to readjust those expectations and what you're saying is so meaningful that I want it out there but yes and through a, a nodding or shaking of the head did all you as ones know that you fired your parents in a way <laughs> any ones how about you Jonathan let's hear what you experience i wouldn't say there was any particular moment where i fired my parents and i don't think i ever saw them quite like that in the first place like i remember uh a specific moment where well 
Same moments where I thought I know more than the adults around me or more insightful about things. Uh, I don't That's think I ever. Kind of like firing the parents if you feel you yeah. know more. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, there was a general. At my parents are general actors, but more so my mum. She would. She'd be so embarrassed if uh, she knew I was talking about her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's. They did okay. They went to school and they basically working class. They left school and then got a job. They didn't really get great grades. My mum wants me and my brother to do better than her and do well and so on. But at the same time, I wouldn't say there was a great strong pressure to ex- externally to be perfect and have perfect grades and so on. It was just a these days we just do well enough and get a better job and so on. Internally, I definitely wanted to be perfect. And I learned very early on that that was not going to happen. Uh, because I learned that I wasn't getting, I was doing okay at school, I was not getting the best grades. It was My home situation was exactly the best for uh, really studying properly because me and my brother had to share a room. Uh, that's quite hard for if you're five in the tri type. Uh, and I've got certain physical issues that uh, meant I wasn't going to be a perfect athlete or anything like that, even though I quite like doing sports and martial arts and stuff. I was never going to be great at it. So, in a way, that's that was kind of relieving. And it was very frustrating and very relieving at the same time. It was a good. I think in the back of my mind, I knew that uh, striving to be perfect all the time could be could have its downside and be quite bad in its own way. So the fact that it just wasn't going to happen was, uh, like I said, frustrating in one way, but relief in another, and probably knowing it's kind of healthy. I have always continued to try and improve in whatever ways I can. Like, I'm always learning stuff, I'm always reading, and I'm always uh, like, planning to get more in shape and uh, learn, learn a martial art because I want to learn a martial art and all these little things. And they're, they're all focused on developing a very specific way of doing things like martial arts, includes values, standards, morals. Yes. And did you find that comfortable? Like, did you like that about martial well, arts? I, yes, I did. I think modern martial arts is sort of moving away from that because it's more focused on the pragmatism, just destroying yeah, that. Multi- the mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, I did have that attraction to that sort of thing, the traditional stuff. I do remember being quite young. Especially when I was very young, and I am Catholic, so this plays into it perhaps. Uh, feeling that we all came from heaven and we're all perf- we're all perfect, and uh, I was a bit more aware of that than the other kids and all the other people around me. And I was trying to hold on to that as long as possible, hold on to that innocence and purity as long as possible, and uh, just gradually losing a sense of it as I got older as you know the world corrupting me slightly shall we say mm-hmm. for lack of a better word uh, that's uh, that was thoughts going through my head as an early as a child uh, yeah so just a quick question with that to clarify were you in trouble all the time or were you seen as the better child? Now, you can still not be the favorite child, but were you think of, thought of as the responsible child, or did you become rebellious? I wasn't particularly, re- I say re- perhaps rebellious, but more when I was older and private when I was living. Uh, but yeah, I was still seen as the more, a well, bit in more general, I'm talking about in general. In general, yes, I was said it was seen like more of the, Responsible child of yeah. the two. Thank you. Now let's look at this 
your feelings about sloppiness or error and why that's so triggering. Suzanne, can you think of an example of someone or several people being sloppy in a particular way that raises that same energy? And even if it's inappropriate to say anything, can you tell us what it's like internally? Um, yeah, sloppiness is definitely a trigger, not not being responsible for oneself and thinking that someone else is going to come behind you and pick up your clothes, wash your dishes, um, orderliness in, in a living space is critically important to me and disturbing the visual beauty of things and things being too close together. I'm really uh, very sensitive to the space between things, um, which comes across when working in design and whatnot, but just, you know, two pots that are too close together. I mean, I just have this spatial arrangement sensitivity. Um, and in my re personal relationships, um, when throw clothing is not picked up, it, it triggers this. Why, like what you said earlier, why don't you pick that up right now? Why do you have to handle it three times? Like when you have it in your hand, I have, I mean, I just see the order of things. You have it in your hand, you go and you put it away. And so it's very hard in my personal relationships. Um, when there's a disparity there, and I try to be accepting. Disarray. What's that? Disarray. Oh, Disarray. yeah. No, it actually, it viscerally bothers me. It actually causes a, dis, a, a discord inside my body. It's a, it's, a, it's a body, a visceral body reaction when things are unkempt, yeah. thrown on the floor, not handled, left for someone else. Yeah. It's so funny. My daughter, she would. I'm meticulous about the floors, and my my little girl, when I walked into the kitchen, she had a bunch of crumbs in her hand. She goes, <laughs> <laughs> just, to, <laughs> just to tease me. Yeah. yeah. But I can't leave anything on the floor. Something falls, there's a crumb. I mean, I, I can barely sit still if I see something on the floor. I got to get up, and I got to fix it. And, yeah. No, um, I, yeah, that's um, that's a key part of the frustration of the one and there's also a way in which each one might describe it a little differently how would you describe it for you joanne well I, i'm okay with dishes in the sink as long as they're stacked and they're soap in them i'm okay with that um things all over the kitchen all over the place and i get I get overwhelmed yeah. when things are because in, of your sensitivity. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even the things behind me, everything is stacked. I, I totally relate to this the spatial placing of things, and if it isn't, I, it just creates incredible amount of anxiety for me. And the other part for me is I can't see it, and I don't know if that's my ADD problem. Is that if when I look in the cabinet, I, I want to see the dishes, the glasses, the coffee mugs lined up for two reasons. One, e it's efficient, right? When things are organized, it's efficient. And two, it's beautiful to me. It's not, oh, you know, I, I'm so rigid that if a glass were off slightly, I, I probably would adjust it. But but, you know, it's there's a beauty in the symmetry and the organization. Yeah, and that, that's another important part of the one, which is why sometimes ones can think there are four at first, but that it's that line between one and four that's always operating. And in order to have utopia, you have to have beautiful things. And things need to look beautiful and be maintained. So maintenance is really important. Now, one thing I want to say is there is more anxiety with the self-pres one. And they are a one lookalike. So sometimes the self-pres six will think they're one because they're both anxious. 
but the locus of authority is very different. With the one, it's I am my own authority. And the six is trying to appease authority. Mm -hmm. So I just want to point out that anxiety does not make you a six. Like some people think, oh, what's your issue with six? And I go, no, I'm just trying to help them type better. So I'm putting in more and more special notices for all the types, actually. It's just if it's not a problem, they don't get them. But that's one way that I've noticed people don't really understand how the self pres one is anxious. But it's a different expression of anxiety than a six has. So thank you for mentioning that. Grace? Um, so I have to say my desk is actually very cluttered. So unlike the other two, I um, don't have the same requirement for orderliness, but I prioritize it. So for example, my work files, I don't like it if other people are slovenly in the way they organize their work. So I'm one of the team managers. And if I'm covering other people's work, and I can see that my team haven't orderly labeled their files, um, it bothers me and I have to try and work out how best to tell them and how best to inform them without upsetting them because obviously as their team manager, I don't want them to sort of be too exactly. down or upset. Um, but it comes down to the efficiency as well because I think, well, if you label your files properly, then you'll be able to do your work more efficiently. And so, for example, um, the dishwasher everything has to be tessellated. I like all the bowls so that you can maximize the way the dishwasher runs instead of wasting the water and that sort of thing. So like I said, the bowls and the plates, I mean, as long as they're relatively orderly, that's okay. But there are certain things that I will prioritize. And, and for me, it's the efficiency that I prefer because that's the end goal. And I think the other thing is if, if people leave mess around, the reason why it bothers me is because I feel it's antisocial, not so not so much that they've left mess in and of itself, but because I think, well, if you don't tidy it up, then you're expecting me to tidy it up. And I think that's disrespectful. And obviously now learning about the Enneagram, I know that it's not a deliberate personal attack at me, but for a long time, I, I really did think that that was the case. I thought you're just deliberately leaving that for me to tidy up because you know that it will bother me sooner than it bothers you. And so um, you're expecting, obviously now I know that's not the case. Yeah, but I mean, that was the most common. React immediately. Respectable was the most common term for the ones. And especially with people that didn't know the Enneagram. So I did a blind study of people that I hadn't met in the different certifications or workshops, just to see what they would say. And people who didn't want to do it and probably would never do it or never be interested. Like often the ISTJ is not interested in typologies. Now more, but 35 years ago, not as much. They hadn't been exposed to it or uh, had the opportunity to see how it's helpful. And you also have three in your tri-type. So what that creates is a way efficiency becomes even more important to you because threes use efficiency to manage their fears of being not good enough and to have to improve and strive and do more. Well, you have to be efficient to accomplish more. So yes, it's totally amplified with you. All right, that leaves Jonathan. So, uh, my mother, I'm bring again, uh, as a self press 612. So, you can imagine what my growing up was as far as my school was like, always told, you know, tidy up, tidy up, tidy up. I was so it was a mess, tidy up. Uh, mm -hmm. So, that was sort of drilled into my head but even without that I do feel like I do like things being orderly and neat and tidy. I also notice that I'll have my own way of ordering things 
And it's very frustrating when I realise it's not the most efficient way, but it's the way that I'm compelled to do things. Like I'll have uh, just... Like, for example, I've got some video games up on that shelf over there, and whenever I... Whenever I take a game, I will lift it out, and when I'm putting it back, I'll put it back exactly where I found it, even if it's not like the most efficient way to get it, or if it's after lift up like five other games, just put it back. Uh, so you like you like things to be routinized. Then you want things to go back of. where they. I don't like to. I don't like to think of it like that, but I do. It's, yeah, no, no, it's yeah, quite common. Fun with the one for sure and the important note here is that each one has their own standards of Mm. what bothers them and what they should or shouldn't do and other people should or shouldn't do just like eights have their own code of honor they're similar a lot overlaps but those little areas that Bother the one sensitivity are the most meaningful in terms of having a higher place on their list of standards. And the other thing I want to talk about, I mean, we've kind of been talking about noticing and correcting errors. We haven't talked about comparing yourself to others. This is also what ones do. Suzanne, can you talk about how that's true? Yeah, I kind of, I, I tend to call it comparison trauma <laughs> because if I go there, um, it, 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 it's, it's a very develop, debilitating experience. Um, and it, it pushes me into striving really hard. Um, and it, 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 it's like a, a real hit of the gap of, of where I could be or what I need to improve and where I'm at. So I, the initial hit is a form of suffering. It just, yes. ugh. And then I start rallying how I'm going to improve, how I'm going to get there, what I'm going to do. And it, it can get quite compulsive. Um, it can drive me into compulsion, yes, depending right. on how sorrowful it caused me to feel. Um, but but I immediately, um, it, it goes to action. It goes to, okay, I got to do this, this, this. And then it's like tunnel vision. It's sort of, I get kind of obsessed because I want to get out of that pain. I want to get out of that pain of not good enough or I, I, I did it wrong and I look at how that person would have done it. I mean, I, and then it's, it's, it can get, um, I can get very, very obsessed with that to the exclusion of other things. And for me, it'd be exclusion of, of personal care, self-care, relationship time, spontaneity, something fun. Um, cause Trying I just to get old. it right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you've introduced the myopia that ones have. And some types are this way, but gut types are generalists and they're universal. But when they're in their defense strategies, they're myopic and they're enduring. So it's very hard for one to stop if they haven't solved an issue. Impossible. (laughs) Impossible. (laughs) I've been up 24 hours saying, I've got to get this to work and workarounds and trying to. That's right. And other things I can't move on until something is solved. That the, the anguish inside is just gripping. So I can't put it out of order either until I get this handled, fixed, done, improved, resolved. Can't move on. It's can't a, move on. very important. And the other thing that a lot of people maybe are not aware of is that Achazo named these three centers. He called them triads. And he called them instinctual triads. The only reason that Naranjo didn't use the terminology of Achazo was to honor his copyright. So he went with things that were in the general public domain 
and the Enneagram was already in the public domain, and Intelligence by Center was already in the public domain. So he called them instinctual triads, and then Naranjo called them centers of intelligence. So that's what came down. And yet, Achazo gave an ego to each center, a name and an ego. And the ego for the gut type is a historical ego, meaning there's kind of there's a remembrance. It's a sensate, physical way in which gut types remember things based on what the weather's like, what the angle of the sky, this, where the sun is hitting. And if you think about it symbolically, as a species to survive, there has to be someone in the tribe that remembers where that peach tree was that was far away, but that bloomed in a certain time of the year. Wow. And it's like moving in that direction physically. So like if someone were to say to me, uh-oh, I'm lost, which way do we need to go? I would remember which way I moved as the car moved. So if we move left, I'd know, oh, we need to go right. I did it wrong. <laughs> I did it the wrong <laughs> Anyhow, it, I would feel it in my body and then tell people, that doesn't mean I really knew, but it always worked out. And I wasn't trying to track that. It's just that gut types unconsciously are tracking that. And the ones and eights seem to retrieve it as a part of their thinking process. And the way gut types think is to act and then think about their actions, then feel their actions. But what Echazo did that was very meaningful in my experience of working with people, is he put sadness in the gut center because the hard types are dealing with grief and shame and they have an image ego and the head types are dealing with fear and paranoia and they have a practical ego, like what do I need to know to survive? And then the gut types have this historical ego but each center is represented by their focus. And the two, three, and four are focused on having the right image so they have the right connection to a person that will protect them as opposed to stealing from them. It's about building relationship. And the head types are about getting the knowledge they need from the person they deemed the most knowledgeable. But that fear and paranoia of the head type and that shame and grief of the heart type merges in the gut type. So it's overwhelm. We're trying to manage overwhelm because we're feeling the shame and the grief and the fear and the paranoia all at once. So we either get into action or we shut down. Right. And the way each type does it is important. And the one tends to be more myopic about things that are really critical to how they need to see it. Not as much about how it's viewed by others, but that's in there. And then in your case, Suzanne, having the four and seven means you really need things to look good. Because one already has a line to four and seven. So if you also, and, and the Solomon seal and the primary triangles, if you just put them on top of each other in the order numerically, the one already has four and seven. So if you have that tri-type as well, then perfectionism goes way up. Mm. Whereas if you don't, if you have five instead, it's not as much of a priority. Yeah. And so, Joanne, in your case, you do have five. So you need things orderly as a one. But how do you notice? And how would you answer the question I asked Suzanne in terms of 
comparing comparing myself to others. I I I have never fit in socially or actually in any regard. I've never fit in. So I do that comparison only to try to understand the differences, not necessarily to judge myself, but only as a, an exercise to try to understand how to navigate. Um, and I can't say that I've been overly successful with that, but, but, um, but in terms of comparing, I just remember being very young and thinking, Oh God, please don't make me like them. You know, that, that really is my thought. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and I can't say that that's actually changed. Um, but I, the area where I did um, really pretty much just kill myself was in related in work. Being self pres work, I want to do, obviously, the best job I can do, not make any mistakes, cover all my bases. And so sometimes I will look at other people to see what that person is doing that I might be able to use to be successful. Um, so I use it more less as a comparison of I'm no good and they're, they're great. Um, what I came to understand about myself is that, you know, some people are just good at better at stuff than I am. Um, different stuff, different yeah. stuff, different stuff than I am. And, you know, and so then comparing myself is not useful, but again, it just gives me some sort of understanding of how do I navigate that thing? But while working, I literally kept saying to myself, well, if I just work harder and just work better and, you know, put in more hours. And the reality is it was diminishing returns. All it did was make me physically and mentally ill um, to the point where I stopped sleeping. I stopped eating. I, you know, I just became ill. Yeah, I overworking. Stopped. And that, that goes back to the sensitivity of one again. We think of gut types as strong and they're solid, but they're enduring, but it could be at risk of their own health, as you're mentioning. Because if you're tenaciously going after something, then you're going to bypass the eating or the sleeping. But if it's a preoccupation, and it is for the one, when, especially if it's something where they feel wrong or they have to deliver something, then this preoccupation becomes so great that they can't sleep anyhow. But I love the way you talk about the diminishing return and it's like finding a way to do that, to calm the mind, but so you can sleep when it's time to sleep. And that's a whole thing for ones to try and work out because if they're triggered, it does not quiet. Oh no, yeah. no, and it still it still happens where I have to make an effort to shut this off. Yeah, otherwise it will keep going, especially anticipating problems. You know what? What are uh, yeah? Anticipation is such a great word for self pres one because it is like. All gut types are looking at the greater weakness. And the eight is looking at that little kind of tiny hole that could eventually bring the whole wall down and there'd be a flood. And the one is looking for that also in behavior, not just in terms of surviving. The expectation goes beyond the practical to what you should or shouldn't do. And each culture has different rules about behavior. 
And I find that the ones try to figure out what another culture does not like as well, so that they're not feeling judged. Thank you. Grace, how about you comparing yourself to others? What does that feel um, like? How do you notice it? Yeah, so again, really interesting to hear, again, Joanne's experiences because I remember when I was a teenager, I felt very different from other people. And, um, and yeah, it wasn't so much I want to be like them, but I couldn't work out why the way that they were able to socially interact with other people my age, how they could just do it with such ease. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, well, what's wrong with me? And I, and partly I realise now that most teenagers just do feel like that. But I think genuinely, objectively looking back, there was just a way that other people could um, just be very comfortable in meeting new people and getting along with people. And I felt that I had something lacking. And I, I still don't really know, but I think it just doesn't bother me anymore. <laughs> um, and so I think that was um, that, that sort of comparison bit that I um, can relate to. Um, and then in terms of defence strategies and becoming very myopic, I mean, I can certainly um, think, you know, when you know when I've been in an argument with someone, and you can get really bogged down in something that when you're in the you know, in the cold light of day, you realise, why did I get so upset about that? But at the time, you really, you have to work really, really, really hard. And now I look back in it, and it was like, having to look really hard. And, you know, now that I recognise what's happening, at least I can try and talk myself out of it. But it's extreme, I mean, it's exquisitely difficult. It I mean, is visceral, so, so it just yeah. overwhelms you. Yeah. Yeah, And, you know, you said something else that's important for social. So feeling like you don't belong can be the social instinct. It can also be five in the tri-type. So if you have both, it's, it's harder. Because fives have shared with me many times from many different countries that they feel a version of this scenario of not getting the same book as the other kids on how to interact with others. And socials feel that way too. If they are able to find something they do well that people like, they'll try and master it. And then that way they're entertaining. People will want to talk to them. People can cultivate their humor because it's a way to manage distress or anxiety. But ones can be very funny, but just using it as a tool to belong is not natural for ones. So it's an interesting dichotomy when you're one and social because you're looking at what other people are doing and trying to be the ideal person, yet your values of one have a different ideal than the group. So it gets very confusing. And often the one will feel that they make themselves odd man out because they, they just can't, it goes back to that logical thinking again. They can't pretend yes. to agree with something that they fundamentally don't. Right? Right. So the social magnifies that. And six magnifies that. And three magnifies that. Because you are only one hex ed type, but you have two primary types. So it's just that slight deviation off the adaptability of 369, and you move into specializing but it happens to be a combination of one, three, and six that are all focused on getting it right. So it really plays out with the integration of the three types as well. Because tri-type isn't just these three centers. As I've said, it creates a new type unto itself that is kind of the mastermind over these types. And they're done in a hierarchy, so stacking order. I had to come up with stacking, you know, like 26 years ago when I did the research because at the time, 
we were taught that there was one type and one instinct and some places didn't even have the instincts so they explained things differently but those that did west of the great divide were those that learned somehow from someone in berkeley somehow from naranjo and they would focus on that singular but when i did all my research and i interviewed these people they had the core fears of three types and if it happens to be your tri-type for example then you'd really see the difference whereas if i were interviewing suzanne she would relate more to the way the triangle is but if she was different if she was a one four six it'd be a totally different story so it's how much do we have of the primary types or are we entirely a hexad type so we don't have anyone because we're teaching ones <laughs> that would have all the primary types but you have the most you have two you have three and six but three and six still kind of are absorbed in your identity and the one wins out but you, it amplifies your anxiety and your need to perfect things that are important to you again everything is what's important to the one's standards and each one is different yeah thank you how about you jonathan so i'm a social one with five so you can imagine how much <laughs> I did relate to what Grace was saying there. I definitely think it's probably worse for me. Uh, I remember, I've been told that, I didn't know this at the time, but I learned years later that my parents were actually called in because I wasn't fitting in with anyone. I was often just being by myself, and the teachers were wondering, is there something wrong with Jonathan? And no, and I was quite fine at home. I was quite you know, social, you know, humorous and stuff at home, but... Uh, Skill just felt very shy and just not understanding that. I was very aware that other the other kids didn't know the same standards that I did and the, the same ideas that I did. Uh, so that definitely caused a whole pain, especially especially my young because yeah, the one has adult concepts yeah. very young, so yeah. it can make you kind of out of sync. I felt like the other kids. I felt like a mix of adult concepts and childish concepts. Like I still enjoyed like cartoons and stuff before the other kids didn't. At the same time, I felt like they didn't really want to be adults. They wanted to be teenagers. They wanted to go drinking and smoking and to, you know, watch, <laughs> notice notice the contempt. <laughs> watch, but, <laughs> yeah, watch uh, you know adult shows and things like that. And I didn't, and I thought those were bad. So. I eased up a bit as I got older, but uh, yeah, that was there. Uh, as far as comparing myself to others, in that I was very aware that I was different pretty much all my life. I don't think I've ever thought I was the same as everyone else, that it was always something different about me. I was fine with that, in age, but it was kind That's of me. amplified when you have social and five, and it. To have five and two in the same tri-type is another one that's like the five wants to isolate when yeah. there's a problem. The one wants to fix it, and the two wants to create relationship and rapport. So isolating and relationship and rapport couldn't be more different. And that's why I say your tri-type is hard to understand, because you will come forward because of that two in the tri-type. And in your case, social, it's even going to be more so. But you're going to give your knowledge because you feel that people should know whatever it is that you're alerting them to. It can seem six-ish in a way, but it, it's the thought processes around it. And you can start to hear in each individual's discussing the adjectives they choose, the scenarios they choose. It ends up kind of clarifying aspect of one's type. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Now, I wanted to just read the strengths, too, because 
sometimes we forget that and then we'll go into the weakness but the strength is the ability to see what needs to be done and the commitment discipline and determination to get it done let me say that again this is at the heart of one the ability to see what needs to be done they see the error or what needs to be corrected but they have within their personality the commitment and determination to correct it which a lot of people don't do they'll point out something that's wrong but they don't feel the need to do whatever it is that could potentially create change and improve the situation. And the high side of one is that they're principled, self-controlled, responsible, thorough, very diligent, conscientious, committed, stable, earnest, meticulous, and then of course the disciplined, rational, and objective. So we count on the one for that and they count on themselves for that if they're not behaving in that manner that kind of commitment and that tendency to be really determined about what they do is also what causes the stress when something goes wrong because put right put right fix it fix it it's kind of going around and around in the cingulate gyrus and if you have that determination you're just not going to let up like we were talking about earlier but the other thing with the weakness of one is this tendency to fall into a kind of a style of response that is defined by or characterized by an intolerant nitpicky and perfectionist attitude so that's how other people can see the one when the one's trying to get something right it can seem nitpicky to someone who does not have that standard when they learn the enneagram then they understand of course that this is the contribution that one makes to the family of man and they can become overly focused on details rather than completing a task you guys have shared that and where they really get into trouble is if they're not functioning at a higher level ones can get self-righteous rigid inflexible and judgmental of themselves and others ones also tell people that they're close to what they're doing wrong and what other people don't understand is it's the one's way of helping the person so they don't make that mistake again but when you're dealing with someone that doesn't know about the enneagram or whatever it just it doesn't quite make sense but if we can say oh yeah that's one of the areas where i need things done a particular way just like you need whatever it is for your type so what would you say suzanne is a good example of what will trigger you into feeling self-righteous even if you don't express it if it's just internal it'll be on your face but what's the most triggering now disrespect you've named anything else that will trigger you false projections and then what do you do with false projections Oof. it's so wrong <laughs> it's violating um, it's 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 cr criminal is the word that comes up my mother is a six my mother is uh, is a ma is a master projector and as a child I found it so assaulting to have stuff painted on me that wasn't true and um, that'll get me triggered that's where my my uh, my anger will immediately come up and I'll get very self-righteous um, and and want to fight back want to defend truth want to, to want to fix the lie want to fix the incorrectness of what's been said and um, 
correcting what somebody is saying mid-sentence is something that I have found myself doing. They've used the wrong word. That's not the right time to say that. This is not the right moment. This is, that's the wrong expression. And that's, that's, that's very difficult for the recipient. But if you're going to speak, speak the truth. Yeah. You're going to speak, speak fairly, get your facts straight, or don't bother me. It's a little bit like that. And that's been very hard on my relationships. Um, you know, in the intimacy research, the Enneagram and intimacy and pair bonding that I did in 1998, I've continued on with it. I always ask people's type, try type, and whatever the topic is. And then I have these ways that I can catch people that are mistyped so that the results are more important and more significant because then I've grouped them with people who mistype in the same way. That's mm. fascinating. There's like a one-ish six, a two-ish six, all the way around. But with the ones, it plays out as the greatest fear in intimacy is lies. If is you know, what? Lies, lying. Well, oh, absolutely. If you feel lied to, even if it's a tiny thing, it breaks the connection. That's right. We bond, and it has to be healed. And I, that was really true for everybody in a way, but they didn't write it. It's the ones that wrote the words, being lied to, lying, lies, just it was really eye-opening because, as you know, I do my studies with international people, different cultures, different languages. But when something's that universal, it's part of the type. So it's going to really show up in intimacy. Mm -hmm. And I want to also highlight that all the gut types, which are also called conservation, are managing sadness so if you think about how you would feel in secure the sexual one feels the most secure when they're attuned with their partner so they're just not side by side but on the same page in alignment in sync the one is very happy and feels they can let go of some of that tenacious behavior, that determination that gets them held up. But then they move it to their relationship and they put all their energy into the security they want with their bond, their mate. And very close friends or family members that you might choose, but there's really never more than five that you totally reveal yourself to. And usually there's just one, maybe two. And that's just the nature of sexual because sexual goes so deep. So if we have the one up here that's looking at the way things should be, and then the sexual is like, I just want to be one with my partner. It can be confusing at times because it's not a natural fit. If we look at a heart type, it's a more natural fit. But to be sexual as a gut type is like, well, I have to sense it and feel it viscerally, but it also engages the heart. And the way Achazo defined the instincts, the subtypes, was to take a Chazo's centers and look at the most primitive form of it. And then he put those under each type. Chazo did not do that. Instead, he added the other fixations. But I think both are meaningful because it gets more and more clear. And you can begin to put that key in the lock and open more doors. But anything you'd want to add to that in terms of the way that runs in relationship as a well, sexual one? Well, here, I'm just soaking up what you're saying, but that, that wanting to be so in line with my 
targeted beloved. And you're absolutely right. It's very few people I share this intensity with and very, I'm very um, peculiar um, about where, uh, where I bring that part of myself and to whom. But um, in the personal relationship in particular, I mean, I've even said you can't possibly stay that way. You must improve. You have to change that. You have to, you can't, you can't continue doing that. You must, the judgmentalness and the, the teacher, I get, I get teachy, I get scoldy, I get correcting, I get, I, I start parenting, I start, instead of being able to accept the level at they're at, you can't stay that way. You can't stay, that defense pattern, you can't, no, you know, so that's been very, very hard. And even though I, I think I'm very loving and generous and giving and all these things in one of my, my daughter, child is a great mirror, because <laughs> I just can't do anything right for you. I'm like, what? <laughs> because if I, the, the seeing what could be improved is effortless. It's data that comes right in so fast. And not sharing it feels like um, withholding. And it's part of my love language. So if she shows me something, I go, oh, that's great, but. And here's how you could do this better and that better. And that's, I just, I have, I am having to learn how to not offer that up as part of how I love somebody because yeah. realizing the impact of that doesn't feel very loving. It feels so not enoughness. So yeah, that's, it's so true. And yet the intent is honorable, really honorable, trying to help someone perfect and be acceptable more places because what the gut types want is acceptance the fears of not existing or that having to exist by not being a problem well that's pretty hard for the eight and one that's big nine, nine just tries to hold it but the one and eight you know, they have to go into action we don't have the inaction is our first response, the way nines do. We have, we're variations on nine. We're just mutant nines and then going into action. So to not say something about a key thing that's your values, like impossible. Yeah. yeah. But we, it feels selfish. It almost feels like I'm harming. I have this information and I don't share it, I don't give it, then, wow, that's so selfish. And it's that's insincere like, if you mm -hmm. don't give it. It's mm -hmm. concealed. Yes. And what do ones dislike the most? Lying. Mm -hmm. So concealment is a type of lie. Mm -hmm. to, Omission of truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To eight and one. And yet we all conceal something. The one conceals their anger until they're justified and even then they still try to language it perfectly yeah yes. thank you that's really good joanne is a self pres one as i mentioned earlier it can look very much like six but you own your own authority but how do you see the self pres showing up in your life the self pres aspect yeah and as a one it mainly shows up in with regard to um, to work and and the need the the sort of the fear and anxiety about the imperfection with regard to work. In other aspects of my life, it shows up in the fact that um, I used to say yes to things that I no longer say yes to if it's if I'm going to be uncomfortable. If it's something where I'm going to be physically uncomfortable um, or emotionally uncomfortable, I now say, I just say no. Um, but when I was younger, I would say, oh, I'll, I would go along more. Um, but now I just feel comfortable going, no, that's not for me. And yeah, it relates back to, am I going to be, you know, I, I don't want to be inconvenienced or uncomfortable. And you want to have comfort because that takes care of the body. Mm -hmm. And the physical body is really important to the self-press. 
Like I kind of forget my body other than maybe wanting to be attractive because I'm focused on who or what I feel really passionate about. But the self press is saying, wait a minute, you have to have a vehicle to be here. So it needs to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's really meaningful in terms of the self press. So if you imagine that you made a mistake, like Naranjo described the self press one as a hand wringer, even if they're not doing this, mm -hmm. underneath, that's what's happening and in the mind that if you've made a mistake that's going to affect your future or your livelihood or your career the basic fundamental things we need in life then it must be corrected and it's distressing until it's corrected and some things can't be corrected mm -hmm. can you speak to that a little bit when you know in the trajectory that it won't be corrected in the way that you would hope because of what it is and yet your one is constantly pressuring you to fix it and your self pres is saying you'll be uncomfortable in it, which makes you more uncomfortable when it's it is. Triggering it, over and over again you have to it, i don't know the best way to describe it um, I, I have, it depends on how tired I am um, and how bad things are. Um, if it's really bad, I just run the anxiety and just feel like, literally feel like dying. But if I have the ability to just sort of get calm, I sit in the, the discomfort and I will apologize profusely. I will do whatever is humanly possible to correct a problem. But if it's something that I can't fix, it's something that I just have learned I have to live with. That's a great way of saying it. And it comes back to the gut type naturally being enduring. The determination moves to enduring if you can't change it but it doesn't mean it's settled or that it doesn't get triggered every time you're uncomfortable mm -hmm. anytime you anticipate that something can be or will be a problem and so going from there it's very meaningful to look at the fact that you have this self press but the two and five make it so that you still have to do some things because you feel you should. Mm -hmm. Like when you made my Enneagram map, that now I've got hundreds of them, you know, modifying them for a particular issue. But that fundamental document you made and spent hours making it, and I didn't ask you to make it. You felt it was necessary, and it was, but I wouldn't have been able to do it. So, yeah, thank you so, again for that. All right. Grace, how do you experience it, the social? How do you notice it? I mean, um, again, it's just interesting hearing um, Suzanne and Joanne's experiences because, yes, I certainly feel like it's not... I, I really have to try very hard to not tell people how I think they should do things. So clearly in work, because I'm a team manager, obviously I get away with it. But I was just trying to think of uh, the times when I felt most let down, because I think what Suzanne was saying about people um, being disingenuous. And I remember the times when I felt really troubled by the relationships that I've that I feel have broken down. It's because it's not necessarily that I think people should agree because obviously I agree that I accept that people have different opinions, but it's people who I invested a lot of time in the relationships with and they behaved in a way that I felt was completely incompatible with having an ongoing successful relationship with. And, I, and I'm not talking about um, intimate relationships, I'm talking about friendships. And I and it really questioned um it made me question, well, it made me uncomfortable for a number of reasons. And I think partly it's because 
I questioned myself because I thought, well, hang on, I'm, I feel like I'm so, as you say, what's this, I, I am my own authority. So because I'm so confident normally that I'm a good judge of character, I was, you know, I was thinking, well, how did I get that wrong? Um, what, what happened in my ability to make that good call about someone and ha- who they are as a person? And, and it's because I just realised that their value systems clearly were not in keeping with mine, even though I thought they were. And that was what was, and it, I remember there have been times when I spent months, I just couldn't get over it. These people that I thought I knew, and um, they were behaving in such odd ways when I thought I knew them. I think that was what I found very, I found very challenging. Exactly. And notice the way Joyce is explaining that too. It's also ISTJ where you're looking above it as a gut type. So the eight, nine, and one are at the top of the mountain. And then three and six are at street level. And then the two and seven are flying above. They're like the fairy godparent or or the fairy. And then the four and five are below street level, like down in in the, (laughs) they describe it like the sewer, looking up through the grates, but don't feel like they're a part of that world. And so they create their own world. And if we listen to the ones, they're recognizing they're at the top of the mountain looking down. They're not underneath looking up, but you also have two types at street level so you want to govern yourself you don't want other people to govern you and the way you said it's incompatible for a successful relationship was very perfect for your dry type leading with one in particular and social because you're talking about friendships and acceptable friendships and if it's too incongruent it's it's hard for the one to overcome those areas. Can you think of a particular area that you notice it the most? I, I don't know. It's, I, I mean, it's it's funny because I only really thought about these examples right now as I'm listening oh. to other people. It's not that I really spent. I mean, obviously, at the time when these um, episodes were happening, it was very um, you know stressful and upsetting, but. I don't dwell on those experiences is only because as I'm listening to other people, then it reminds me of episodes in my life where these things have happened. So I have to say, I don't honestly think, I mean, thankfully they don't happen very often. Um, Yeah. But it's, you know, and I didn't, you know, and I suppose because I'm so new to all of this, it's only now starting to arise in my consciousness because obviously at the time when all of this stuff was happening, it was all very confusing. Um, And and it's like I say, only now when when I'm having to think about it, and then when I'm listening to other people's experiences, and I'm thinking, oh yes, I remember when when that happened. So who knows? Maybe other things will emerge. Yeah. Um, and- no, you you've just said the perfect things for your tri type and the social because you clarified friendships, and when you're sexual, a friendship could still be a really intimate friend. And or it could be a child or a parent or a cousin, but someone where you feel in sync. So we don't need to clarify. We just know there's a huge difference in people and what we've chosen. Whereas the social is trying to gather together the group that reflects what they enjoy, but they also want the group to have their values. Like one social one shared with me that she would join groups to make a difference. And then once she was in the group, she felt there were people who weren't trying to make a difference. They just wanted a group. And then the frustration would come up because she would feel like she's doing all the work. And then her goal, which was to make, this change or be a part of this change, in this case, her city. And then she felt trapped. Like if she left, she was not completing her obligation. 
If she didn't leave, she was going to be just like crazy with frustration. So that dilemma can play out because you have to do what's right and responsible. But on the other hand, you also have to take care of yourself. And if you're in a situation where you're constantly being triggered, it's not good for any of us. But it's like a moral dilemma for the one as to what they should or shouldn't do. But you could quickly name friendships, and that's really meaningful in terms of instinct. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been really fascinating. Thank you to everyone for obviously participating as well. See you soon. Thank you so much, Grace. Jonathan. Yeah, I was relating to what everyone was saying. I was relating a lot to what Suzanne was saying about the projections and the lies and all those things. I've had those, I've seen those things, I've been on the wrong end of those things, and I've seen other people on the wrong end of those things. I think one of the reasons that I want to improve is because. Uh, getting things right is very important to me. I think what triggers me is when people are being, I've seen people are being one-ish and being uh, outspoken and correcting and stuff, but they're doing it wrong. That bothers me. Like they're uh, making mistakes that I perhaps would have made when I was younger, or they're being too impulsive or they're being too angry. They're not understanding the other person's point of view. Perhaps they don't even want to because they want to be, it can be very satisfying to be angry. we very, yeah, there's a show about it. Yeah, and, uh, as, self-righteousness comes out, it's satisfying, it cleanses the, yeah. It's, yeah, at the same time, it can be wrong in itself, it can be corrupting in itself. But uh, I do remember once seeing a type one uh, explaining how to. Uh, talk to someone who's got views that are uh, quite wrong and controversial and stuff. And and a type six came in and really supported them and praised them for it. And that really bothered me because the type six, it felt like the type six was seeing the one as the good cop to their bad cop. Like they saw what the type one was doing as manipulative and they were praising it. Uh, and it's hard to explain without going into details, but uh, I've seen that quite a few times where it's like uh, people, it can feel like people want you to be good so that they don't have to be. That's a good way to say it. So how do you find that you correct people or tell them what they should or shouldn't do? Because with the social, it feels like a moral responsibility. Yeah. Uh, I say a lot of it happens on, on the internet when we're browsing through things, seeing the same stuff, obviously, sort of five is that there. Uh, I've learned to temper a bit sometimes because there's just too much wrong to correct. Uh, and also because I've learned that people just won't listen or won't understand what I'm trying to say. Sometimes also I get it wrong and that's really embarrassing and annoying. Yeah, very yeah. embarrassing. Yeah, so because all... especially if that's the foundation of your structure for your defense strategy, reaction formation is keeping you from being wrong. And so if something happens where you are wrong, it's like all the pieces come apart and the shame is overwhelming, like Suzanne talked about too, and Joanne talked about in terms of the horrifying feelings. So yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. And do people push back on the internet when you're, or are you saying they're wrong and then they prove that they're right and you're wrong? All of, all of it happens. I mean, obviously usually I'm right, uh, but <laughs> You know, there are times where I'm wrong or there's times where we just do not agree or we're coming from such different places. The Enneagram and other typologies have really helped me understand how people are seeing things and where they're going wrong. And at the same time, it's very enlightening, but it's also very frustrating because you kind of know that it's not going to be, it'll be way too hard to sort this out over something that is important but trivial at the same time. Mm-hmm. Excellent. 
Yeah. Now, what did I not say about your type that you feel is important that you want to name or that you maybe wanted to say, but it didn't come up in the context of the way I was following you? Mm. Anything? Um, I'll go first. Uh, there was two things that I thought about. The first was you kept talking about utopia and uh, how utopian the ones can be. That reminded me of when I was younger. I was dwelling on utopia and how a perfect society would be, and I had this revelation that was kind of sad. But uh, I think it was kind of building up over time, this revelation. But uh, I realised that in a utopia, I would feel kind of worthless, and a lot of people I it would share my values would feel kind of worthless because there's nothing to improve. There's nothing... <laughs> There's nothing to do, nothing to get better. Uh, and I also have a bit of resentment. You can create the new, though, which... No, because then it's not perfect. That's the contradiction. That's the paradox. Like, if it's a really perfect utopia, there's nothing to change. And in a way, that can be very sad because I'm... It is. Like, it's difficult to be charitable when everyone has everything they need, for example. <laughs> yeah, you, you certainly um, wouldn't stand out as charitable if everyone's yeah. charitable. Yeah. There was also a bit of resentment because I realised that people would enjoy it the most. I didn't know the word at the time, but now I would say they're sevens and past nine and stuff like just They didn't necessarily... There's no sense of earning it, no sense of uh, doing anything to... Uh, deserve it they're just enjoying everything it's like then that goes back to what i was saying a moment ago it's like uh you know i was good or other people were good so that other people don't have to be like because other people have built this utopia yeah there's an other people are enjoying them and enjoying it shall we say yeah that's such a good point because that's where the judgment of one is like wait you're enjoying it without earning it Mm-hmm. That's not just because both one and eight are focused on justice, but yeah. the one feels they must be judicial, they must be just, whereas the eight fights for justice or calls off what's unjust in the moment. Mm-hmm. So they're, but they're two, they're two sides of the issue of justice. Oh. It's not just that I feel that I feel like everyone should be, especially when I was younger, I felt everyone should be like that. And at the same time, I felt very bad and corrupt for even thinking like that because it's like uh, that would be a reason not to make the world better because I feel like people have to deserve it. And that's just a wrong thing to even think about. It, so it's exactly. a very complex paradox thing. So that's the same thing. That's the second thing I was going to say. There's a sense of, Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Right. Uh, I was um, actually transitioning, not talking to you specifically, but it's uh, a very strong value of the one. And a lot of times ones just then get upset with themselves for even wanting a utopia. But they do know they want their life to be the way they want. How do you notice that, Suzanne? Or did you ever feel that you wanted it and then it was wanting too much? Or did you hear from others that it was too much? And how did you manage that? Great question. I I never feel that um, what I'm pushing for is too much. And I, I have an incredible amount of endurance and determination. Mm-hmm. It's like a bulldog crossed with an ant. That's how I see type <laughs> one. It just, it's relentless and I don't get tired. Um, but for, uh, for others, it's been too much. Um, I've heard that in my life. Just, it's fine. Just let it go. It's good enough. I, and until I hit that mark, wherever I've set that marker, it's too uncomfortable for me. So it doesn't matter if, if, the outside world says it's great or that's perfect or it's fine. If I haven't landed it for myself, I, I can't, there's no serenity. And, um, and that's been, you know, uh, 
that's been a negotiation in my life in learning how to not judge others for um, not striving in the way that I do or that, you know, I'm up at I'm still up at 4 a.m. and they've fallen asleep behind me on the floor at 1230 at that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and not thinking, oh, they're so lazy and they're so weak. I just no, it's just because I'm I'm that bulldog crossed with an ant, and I'm going to keep going. So, <laughs> learning that acceptance of of the differences in us has been enormous for me, so that I don't project the "What's wrong with you? Uh, why don't you? Why isn't improvement important to you?" I don't project that onto others, like I did as a younger woman. Yeah, very of callously. That's the benefit of the Enneagram is that we understand the mystery behind other people's types too. So yeah. before I just thought, why are they lying all the time? I was there. <laughs> but then learning the Enneagram and other typologies, it's, we're all tracking different things. Yeah. So they evaluate things differently. But yes. Right. Yes. Right. Indeed. It didn't happen that way. Nope. I know. Yeah. I, yeah, it did. The, the conviction is very, very powerful, and I, I don't, I don't struggle with doubt. And it, probably a, a healthy amount of doubt would be good for me at some at times, but because the conviction is so strong, and um, it's not that I'm trying to be right. I just believe I'm right. Yeah, it's, it's very. <laughs> but it's part of your. Uh, this is the way it is. To be right, so it's the way it is exactly, and that's. What we were born with, you know, in the early days, it was um, thought that it was based on nurture that we became our type, and that's how Ichazo started it in Naranjo. But then quickly, with brain science and people, you know, being born and growing up, their type, it's clear that it's. We're born with it's it. Wiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what I did find is that people can have a positive or negative identification based on their nurturing or lack yes. thereof. Yes. So both are true in a way. Yeah. But the key elements are there from birth. Yeah. Absolutely. That that holds true for my own observ observations of myself, my daughter raising a child. Um but yeah, the the relaxing, relaxing um, into the higher side of our gifts, realizing that we start with these neural propensities and proclivities, and they're wired around particular gifts and contributions to humanity, and then working with the liabilities as they get compulsive or uh, polarizing, and that's been really, really useful from my life. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne, is there anything that I didn't say or, or you want to say? Just that hopefully as we get older, we, we do improve. And I, I, I see in myself the anger that I had as a child and as a young person, and even through most of my adult years, that this the understanding of myself as well as others has helped me mellow out a little bit and i mean it, it there's still there are still triggers obviously you you know talking about what righteous indignation um mostly that that for me still is more less about me and more about what i see outside in the world, because I still, I know you, utopia is not realistic, because as soon as you create one, it will be corrupted somehow. But, but it's still a fantasy. Um, that you know, I mean, it's still there in the back of my mind. I still <laughs> try to make it, even if I only do it Mr. Miyagi style, where I create my own little world. I did this in my home. Yeah. Everything around me was horrible, but within my my environment, within my uh, family, within my friends, I have created my own best version of, of life. And when I go out into the world and have to interact, um, you know, then, then I have to, you know, I put on my little armor and, um, 
and take a deep breath and know that things will not be perfect and to to take those things as this is an adventure and by taking that different point of view not striving for perfection although i still can't drive down the road and not want to relandscape everybody's yard <laughs> or around the freeways or the to tidal. make it more beautiful yeah, and you know, haven't so chosen the plants yeah. that go together with the colors and exactly yeah. you know i mean it still happens but it's not it's not debilitating as it used to be so i don't know if that's just a product of getting old or you know <laughs> i'm old and i'm tired um but <laughs> But, but that's kind of but, where I've gotten. And Ralph Prez one says that when they're like 30, they think they're old and tired. I've been old and tired since I was five. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I, you know, I mean, I was a five-year-old and said, you know, with regard to my parents, when I was talking about firing them, I said, you know, I'm getting out of here when I'm 18. I was making my plan. Um, but... I'm, I, I do my best to try and not to let my self pres limit my life. Yeah. And my self pres one, um, I do edit, not always, but hopefully I've become more considerate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can you each just say one thing very quickly, a word or a couple words? about what you like about being one. I'll start with you, Joanne, if you... If it, you know, uh, hopefully a high moral center. Yeah. I think that that's important. And I, I like being on the top of the mountain. Yeah, there you go. Nice. Right. It's a, I mean, you, you just know, have to climb up there, but yes. Well, yeah, you know, but I mean, the idea that you can, you can hopefully see farther. Let's and they'll... It it's great. And what do you like, Jonathan, about being one? I don't have to climb on top of the mountain. I was born on top of the mountain. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't think anything in particular. I, just, I do like it. I like the feeling of conviction and the strength and the foresight and all these things. So. Yeah, foresight is an important strength of the gut types, but in particular, the one in eight. Thank you for mentioning that. Suzanne, what do you like about being a one? Overall, I'd have to say there's this, this, I can rely on me. There's this feeling inside of me of, I've got this. Yeah. I got this. That's a great one. Well, I want to thank you so much. I want to talk to each one of you personally. And of course, seeing you makes me want to do that more. If I see you in a class or something, it's not quite the same as that free flow, but I really appreciate all of you coming on to support this approach to getting at the deeper feelings of the types. And you guys were extraordinary. And I'm going to open it to questions. You can go if you want to, or if you want to help answer the questions. Before I go to those, is there anyone in the group that wants to ask a question? In a way, I was asked, why the ones are righteous about their truth and you answered it i think it came up in the natural context of this discussion and very very well actually another question how do you tell the difference between a sexual one and a self press for because the sexual one is a gut type that is triggered, motivated, initiated based on their need for intimate bonding that is a sure thing. And it's with a person and it's revealing the heart. And so that's different. The one wants that. And it is the complexity of the two coming together. And it's a good question because the way Naranjo later taught the self pres four was the tenacious quality. Of the fours, the self pres four can endure 
suffering for the sake of beauty? So it was actually a great question. And yet the four is leading with the way in which they personalize things as a four. But the motivator, the engine, is this need to gather the resources that they want to feel secure. So all self-pressed people are always gathering that and feel anxious and distressed if they don't have it. Now, some people can just provide it. Like I have the table that, you know, I can move and be comfortable and <laughs> the chair so I'm really uncomfortable and the footstool. So I do have self-pressed second. I'm going to make sure my comforts are met. But the self-pressed four in their comforts has to still have an idea of different beauty. It isn't just that the fours want beauty because all sexual subtypes want beauty and attractiveness. But the four wants the beauty to be the driver. So they will endure difficult circumstances because the end result will be beauty. Now, the one is already going after that thing. And because of their passion for their mate or their relationship or their perception of their relationship, it's already occurring, but it's coming from being visceral in terms of solutions rather than being overly romantic. The the fours have more hope because they're part of the heart triad and the ones are more practical in their perception of things. And yet in closing, Naranjo felt that there were four types that did not have access to all three centers, which is why he was seeing these subtypes. And as I said, Ichazo over time began to use the term trifix for individuals and not just his concept that he began in 1968 and taught in Eureka in 1970. So both are leading there. And to really answer that question, I kind of need to know the other types in the tri-type because that's how it'll play out. Another one was how does a one know when they feel secure? Suzanne, you want to try that one? Mm. With another person in relationship, definitely yeah. coherence, coherence, truthfulness, perception of truthfulness, shared truthfulness, shared values, big Really big in, integrity. In, in this question, there's an explanation that they're always disappointed in people. And the question was whether or not they just don't recognize security when they see it, or if there's something they need to know. But you just said it perfectly because what did you say earlier? Lies are the thing that breeds kind of a whole thing even white lies ones mm -hmm. don't like because you're mm -hmm. still not getting this straight story mm -mm. you're not standing on solid ground exactly. yeah. and another question interesting i'm going to skip to this question because it's like a a good companion to it and it's how do ones repair a breach from being too critical where they hurt someone, in other words, for being too critical. How can they move towards healing that? If the other person's mad at them, I'm assuming. <sighs> when you do make a mistake, what do you do? Do you stand back and think about it? Do you write something? Do you try to find the truth in both perspectives? Like, what do you do? I think really what the person's asking. I would say all of the above. Like, all those things that 
kind of pin what the actual issue is in the moment. A lot of it is down to manners and politeness and uh, learning, again, learning to improve in order to have better communication and better understanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does depend a bit on where the other person is coming from, like whether it's a genuine mistake or whether they're like really upset or they're just being, if they're being irrational or if they're being selfish, then you're just a waste of time. And sometimes it pairs to let the other person vent and then just move on. Uh, yeah, notice how you're saying manners too. That's social appropriateness. Hmm. So that's really a great perspective. I would say I've done all. I would say I've done all three. I've like uh, explained myself, or I've uh, moved. If I thought I made a mistake, if I thought I was the one in the wrong, or if I just completely misunderstood the situation, I can stab, uh, step back, get very anxious and upset, but then go over my head and then try and make sense of it, mm-hmm. and then uh, come back and try and make it right. If I can, if sometimes how, how quickly I get the impression this person's asking how quickly. How quickly? I can do it quite quickly. Usually, it's within minutes. Sometimes, if it's really bad, I will take. It's really. It kind of depends on what the situation is. Really, like. Sometimes it requires an immediate response. Other times it's better to let things uh, just, you know, simmer or play out. Sometimes people don't want you to do that either. Like, they uh, take it as they'll take it the wrong way or they'll think you're not getting them or you're not letting them be angry or whatever. Yep. Uh, yeah, always... Thank you. That's all good. Thank you very much. Val? Yeah. Hi. Right. Thanks for um, trying to speak. Um, with res- retrospect to um, knowing the Enneagram, um, when you've done not the right thing in the past, how do you feel about that? So, when the one makes a mistake and hasn't done the right thing, what do they feel about it? In terms of knowing the Enneagram now that um, oh. they actually may have been in the wrong. Ah, yeah, that's a good one. I remember realizing that my teasing actually hurt my three friend when she was getting a report card. And I go, it must be really boring for you to get your report card because you always get straight A's. But actually, when I learned the Enneagram, I realized that gave her that good feeling. And worse to me, they could be a surprise here or there. I wasn't really tracking it. But yes, now that you know the Enneagram and you look back and realize you were wrong about something, how do you feel about it? Well, in regards to that, is like if you talk about looking back and realizing someone's Enneagram type, I don't think I use, I don't think I was necessarily wrong in those situations. I think it's more just I can understand they're different how they saw things differently. And I would have been wrong in the practical sense. Like I would have been wrong in my approach or I didn't didn't understand. I could have said things differently. Uh, I'm usually quite good at intuiting people's different perspectives, even before I went to Enneagram. So that wasn't... Enneagram always clarified a lot of the stuff I was noticing and did intuitively. Uh, it's more like making sense of things. That's how I see the Enneagram. I also want to distinguish between uh, being wrong morally and being wrong practically or pragmatically. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, oh, as far as that, as far as that goes, I don't think I would consider myself or anyone to be wrong morally if they just did not understand because they didn't have the information of the Enneagram, whatever. Thank you, Jonathan. I just want to see if Joanne or Suzanne wants to add to that. I think it's, I, I can sort of, in terms of sometimes saying something that might hurt somebody's feelings without intending to 
is it's I would I would usually just try to respond quickly and apologize. But if there were something bigger brewing, you know, um, some serious misunderstanding of some kind, I would probably take the time, let the situation settle, and then I would um, talk to that person. But there is a distinction between something that might be, I would find um, morally wrong versus something that was just sort of uncomfortable, you know, just a my unintended, unintended uh, mis, you know, misspoken. It goes back again to the intent being honorable, but the delivery now that you know the Enneagram that you'd modify. Yeah, I mean, I, I told my friend who is a, a sexual um, counterphobic six, this is many years ago, her anxiety about her appearance was significant. And I, she kept changing her hair color and not for the better. <laughs> and I, I just, you know, I said, you really need a new hobby. <laughs> and I, I made a joke out of it. <laughs> like, you know, and she was really offended. But it was really, it was just very kind of, you know, it's like, stop that. Yeah, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Yeah, no, thank you. Suzanne? Well, I'd say now, thanks to the Enneagram, um, you know, it's helped soften my reaction to mm -hmm to doing something wrong. First, the, the, the self-attack, the self-punishment was yeah. a lot higher um, before I knew the Enneagram. Um, however, um, and if I, if I agree, if let's say someone has come to me and said, you've done something wrong or you have hurt me or it's a process of analyzing what I did. If the other person has a right to be mad at me, I mean, I do that piece. And, and then if, if it's if I feel that it's it's truthful that I was wrong or I said something wrong or I did something wrong, then I will apologize um, very sincerely. But it will never be gratuitous. Um, mm -hmm. It has to be grounded in something very real and fair and um, just for me. So there's an anal analysis an analysis uh, analyzing process for me as to where I messed up, how the person reacted, what's right, what's the right thing to do here. Um, but that that process has gotten a lot softer. And I now realize that while my intention might have been great and maybe I did say, I, I maybe I was right or I said something truthful, Dr. Daniels used to say, you know, sometimes what's right is not what's best. Never yeah. forgotten that. And I, that has sat on my heart in a really big way. And um, David David had such a beautiful way of dropping into the heart for all nine types. So now I realize and, I, and I'm able to apologize for the impact I had, whether or not it was my intention. And exactly. that's, that's thanks to the Enneagram. Yeah, I think it is for all of us. Uh, good question, Val, and, and thank you panelists for answering that because even in your answer you were talking about your focus of attention and that's why I stress the lexicon is so important to determine type and for those of you that don't know one question I had is like where's all that information on the instincts and the research that I had online my original research it's still there the problem is I don't use any gram explorations at all anymore. And I have two websites. The test website has a lot of information on it too, but the primary website is katherinefavor.com where it's like a, a newspaper website. So it's not done with a lot of white space. There's a lot of data in there. There are blogs. There are, yeah, like almost too much stuff there. So that's just katherinefaber.com. But I, nothing's been updated or changed with Enneagram.net in over seven years. So I just 
Maybe David will add stuff, but so far he hasn't. So I hope that answers it for everybody. Thank you all very, very, very much. I really appreciate all of you. And I was touched by what you said. I think other people will be too. So I'm very Catherine. grateful. Catherine, thank you so much. This was just so insightful and learning intensive, and your wisdom is just so fantastic. I've just been soaking you up, and everyone, thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys. Thank I you all. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Till next panel. Okay, Wonderful. thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.